First things first, Happy New Year guys. I took a week off last week to eat, to drink, to be merry, but we are back to business in 2021 and it's time to get stuck into a brand new true crime story. Welcome to the anniversary. It took 12 years, six of which were spent on the FBI's most wanted list to capture Yasir Abdel Saeed after the events that took place on January the 1st, 2008. It was on this day that he took his two daughters, Amina, who was 18, and Sarah, who was 17, out to eat, or so he said. He drove them to an area called Irving and he shot them. Both girls died and their dad, their murderer, went on the run. From the very beginning, this story was labelled and has been labelled and is still labelled as an honour killing. Yasir Saeed was born in Egypt and he came to the US on a student visa in 1983. He married Patricia Owens in February of 1987 when he was 30 years old and she was 15 after a year of dating. She grew up in a poor family and was happy to escape. Her parents did give him special permission to marry Patricia because she was 15 years old. She had three children all a year apart. Islam, their son, was born in 1988. Amina was born in 1989. And Sarah was born in 1990. Now, growing up, the two daughters, Amina and Sarah, told family and friends that their father had not only physically but sexually abused them. This was not a happy household. On several occasions, Amina appeared at school with bruises. One time she went to school with a split lip and said that her dad had kicked her in her face, but her mum, her dad, refused to take her to hospital. The kids often went to school with welts on them, with bruises on them, with cuts on them. The physical abuse seemed to be clear. And on one instance, the sexual abuse allegations were taken seriously when Sarah and Amina went to their grandparents and told them in graphic detail what their father had been doing to them. They were taken to a children's hospital where they were examined. Their father was interviewed by the police. Their mum and dad separated, but their dad harassed the mum's family, sending letters, phone calls showing up at the house. And the girls were made to retract their statements so that their dad didn't go to prison and their mum returned to the family home and they all just kind of got on with life. Till this very day, their mum, Patricia, after everything that has taken place, still says that she doesn't think their dad would ever sexually abuse them. There are so many documentaries on this case. There is so much footage of the girls as well because their father obsessively filmed them constantly. At first, when you watch these archive home movie footage type video things, it looks like any other dad who's obsessed with his video camera. But when you have hindsight, it just becomes that much more insidious, really. Amina was afraid of using public phones. She was afraid of sitting in cars and speaking. She said that her dad gets in everywhere that he knows everything. She smiled to the customers. Bella, she has to. Part of her job. She's in trouble. Amina was said to be super girly, she was said to be super confident, she was said to be the type of girl who made friends wherever she went, wasn't afraid to tell you what she thought, and was extremely, extremely beautiful. Sarah was beautiful as well, but she was a tomboy, she was a little bit more reserved, but she made friends super easily as well. There were so many rules in their household, but one of the biggest ones, no dating American boys. The one thing that the girls were allowed to do and that Amina loved was Taekwondo. And this is where she met her first boyfriend. His name was Joseph and pretty soon after meeting, they um, exchanged numbers and they were texting each other, they were calling each other. She was about 16 at the time and it was just like, you know, your first boyfriend, your first relationship, but she was of course very worried about what her dad would do. Her and Joseph had code words, so she would use them when she couldn't talk. The closer that her and Joseph got, and the closer that she got to Joseph's mum as well, the more she started telling them about her home life, the more she started telling them about the abuse that she suffered at home, and about being sexually abused by her dad. In an email that Amina sent, 
she said that he treats me like a whore and she also told authorities that she had been penetrated at least once by her dad in the home videos that archive that i was talking and showed you a little bit earlier some of the videos are just gross isn't even the word for it there's one video where amina and sarah are sleeping and their dad is like filming them and zooming in on their legs and like commenting on their bodies nice legs when her father found out that she had an American boyfriend, he packed the family up and he shipped them overnight to another town and they went to Louisville. Amina was able to email Joseph's mum because they'd become so close. She told her that her dad beat her up when she wouldn't give him the name or address of her boyfriend she was scared that her dad was going to hurt him and it was around this time that he took her to Egypt and tried to arrange a marriage for her as well to a much older friend of his she rejected the marriage proposal but she knew that she had to get out she texted Ruth, uh, Joseph's mum, the entire way through she was in such a dark place she attempted suicide and she just didn't know how she was going to get out of the situation where her dad literally wouldn't let her her live her life patricia their mom finally decided that it was time to leave her husband for good during christmas of 2007 when he had told her that he was going to kill amina for dating an american boy she packed up amina and sarah they went to kansas to her sisters and she told her that she would never go back to her husband because she knew that he would kill their daughters they had a uh, new names and they had burner phones but somehow Patricia had a conversation with her husband and on December 30th of 2007 she decided it was time to go back home. Now Sarah reluctantly agreed to return but Amina refused. She sought refuge in her friend's house and she didn't want to leave. Her mum went there to get her, she was banging on the door, they were arguing at the doorstep but eventually she wore Amina down, said their dad had forgiven them, like it's fine, don't worry about it amina sarah and patricia all packed up and went back to the family home on january the 1st 2008 so 13 years ago this week yasir decided that he wanted to take his daughters out to eat initially their mum patricia wanted to hop along but he said that he wanted to talk to the girls himself in private and that he was taking them out so she didn't go along with them. He drove to the Omni Mandalay Hotel. Amina sat up front with Sarah in the back passenger seat. He parked at the car, he turned and he pulled a gun on Amina and shot her twice in the chest. He then turned to Sarah in the back seat and shot her nine times before getting out of the car and fleeing leaving his daughters to die alone. Sarah somehow, even though she had been shot so many times, managed to call 911. And I have the 911 call that Sarah made. If you don't want to listen to it, if you don't want to hear it, I completely understand. Please just skip forward 30 seconds and it will be gone. What's going on, ma'am? Those were the last words that Sarah spoke because she died before the police could find her. It was in December of 2014 that he was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives lists with a $100,000 reward for any information leading to his arrest. He was almost caught actually in 2017. According to an affidavit, a maintenance worker at the Copper Canyon apartment complex in Bedford, who was dispatched to fix a water leak, found a man in the apartment that was leased to Yasser's son, Islam. The maintenance worker told the property manager, who was aware of Islam's fugitive father, and called the FBI. But it wasn't until August of last year, 2020, after nearly 12 years on the run, he was finally apprehended. The FBI raided this home in just Justin Wednesday. Records reveal they've had it on surveillance since August 17th. It's purchased in the name of Dalal Saeed, a niece of Yasser. The FBI spotted Yasser's son, Islam, walking in and out with bags of trash. Agents witnessed Islam and Yasser's brother, Yasin, disposing of the trash at a South Lake shopping center. Agents searched the bags and found cigarette butts and other items. Agents then executed a search warrant and found Yasser inside the home in Justin. I I will be giving you a cheeky update on the story once it pans out, once the trial happens and it comes to its conclusion. Uh, for now, that's all you're getting. It's all I've got 
so thank you for watching this episode of the anniversary please 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 use a description box i've put a link to a documentary some podcasts that i listen to to get the info for this story i'll see you next week for a brand new episode happy new year and stay safe